John said, I don't see it. I don't, I'm a terrible <laughs> podcast owner. I just, I don't even watch it. <laughs> I record them and then forget about it. Yeah. I don't, I have, like, I don't read the comments. I don't do any of that crap. I just, I want to talk to you. Yeah. I just want to yeah. talk to you. Cool. When, when I started this and you're like, yeah, I'll come on. I'm like, cool. Yeah. I get to know Dan because our first conversation at um, Brightsmith. Yeah. It was kind of like a little podcast. Yeah. We were just talking about a little business, a little bit of what you like, a little bit of what I like. And, yeah. You know? But, anyways, um, tell me what you do for a living. I mean, I already know, but. <laughs> sure. <laughs> tell everybody. What sure. You do for a so, um, honestly, I just love business. I got into uh, financial planning about six or seven years ago. Yeah. And that's really just wor- serving business owners and yeah. people in sales. I, yeah. I really am able to control and understand people's cash flow mm-hmm. and really build a plan um, there, help them mitigate risk, things like that. It's bridged off into becoming a partner in a um, local handyman service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of bridged into just being able to partner and have conversations around pretty much anything real estate, which has been yeah. pretty cool. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, I didn't really understand and I still kind of don't understand. So when you say financial planner, are you just having conversations with people to get to know who they are and learn about them and then helping them guide through their life journey? I, Because I, I know you also have, like, the life insurance side of it and then sure. you have the business side of it. Is it just, a, like, a conglomerate? Like, is it a, is like a whole thing? Because it's, yeah. it's, when you say financial planner, I feel like that doesn't – that description, that word doesn't fit what you do yes. specifically. Because I see your stuff on social media – yeah, and how you help people, and you're always talking to people, and you're always doing real estate stuff. You know the the A stuff. You know, like it's it's like you you're in yeah. a lot of different things. So I'll kind of start with like, so the financial advisor, financial planner, financial whatever coach, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, years and years ago, let's call it like let's say it's the '80s. If you were a money manager, that was your name, money manager. Yeah. If you like a wealth manager, if you were selling life insurance, you were a life insurance salesman or life insurance agent. Yeah. And everywhere in between. Now they kind of took the word. If you have any of 27 different licenses, you can call be called a financial advisor. So oh. I can literally have seven people in the room that are all financial advisors. We could all work with different types of people. all do different things. See, that's what I meant. So I that's what gets yeah, confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. Yeah. People all the damn time are like, you just manage people's money, right? Or you just sell insurance, right? And like the word just, I'm like, well, we do do some of that, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's so we confining. do also do yeah, some yeah. of that, true. But what I actually do is I align almost specifically with my average client is 35 years old. Yeah. Usually they got- How old are you? Um, 29. Oh, yeah. Yeah, usually they have kids, usually got some moving pieces. Yeah. Hey, I just got married, had, maybe I'm getting my second home, had my third child. Um hey, I'm, I'm about to start my second business, et cetera. So like early on in the planning process, it's not like, oh, there's a need for moving your money or there's a need for life insurance. It's actually like until I can see through the lens of of Steven or the person I'm talking to or the people I'm talking to and be able to understand what's going on in their world like holistically, 30,000 yeah. foot and dive in, not just like one piece, yeah. I will make a recommendation. So planning really has good. to do with understanding them. Yeah. And at first they have to understand me, how I work, what we do, what our services are, yeah. what our team looks like, what's the value prop, all that stuff. But once you get to the point where it's like, okay, this is how it works. Can we pause it for one second, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, continue. Yeah. Well, so, I was gonna say, that's why I feel like that name doesn't do you justice because and this is just me outside of it as like an outsider sure. looking in when, if you hear financial planner, I think all, just immediately because of that title, people pigeonhole you yeah. into a thing. I almost wish you would call yourself just like an advisor or just a friend. Cause that's almost what you become. Sure. A- and me myself, I know on my journey as a business owner, having a family wanting to manage my finances, there's times that I would, I would pay somebody to just be quote unquote, my friend, which is essentially what you are because I just like, having a sounding board like hey does this sound stupid hey should i move my money here hey i'm thinking about making this business move like should i do that or hey you know this is going out my family i want to know how to structure this it it almost is limiting to your to you and your team to be called a financial planner because it just it puts you in such a category yeah no i almost should come up with like a new unique name for you it's it's definitely interesting to think about because i think you're probably right um 
it's I started there. Now I'm learning more about business by working with business owners yeah. from an advisor role. But now I'm actually in another business where I'm in the trenches and yeah. so on and so forth. So a lot of the things we talk about uh, is now coming to fruition on a lot of fronts. Plus, I'm learning from so many other great people. I'm actually yeah. doing it on some other fronts as well. So I do agree like it is it is sometimes as an advisor, as a coach, as a guide, as a friend. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the times, like from a compliance standpoint, I wouldn't be able to just be like, I'm an advisor and then sell stuff. Because like, for example, if I was like fee only just giving advice, that would be a little bit different. If I was selling different things, it would be a little bit different. So like it, it works oh, very... So like a, is it like a legality thing? Yeah, so like in our world of compliance... Um, I forget that you have to follow all Yeah, like for, I'll things. give you an example. If you said... I don't know. I know the whole picture and you're like, Hey, we are figured out a way to save $10,000 a month and we move some money and whatever. And I'm like, we're going to put all $10,000 into X product, Y product, whatever. Most of the time that probably wouldn't make sense. Like one specific thing, like it's not your business. It's literally a product. We, we put money in yeah. the compliance department would say, okay, so why do you want to do that? And I would write the whole notes, why we talk, what you said, your goals were, what the whole picture was. And at the end of this story, they would say, probably not. You can't really freaking do that. <laughs> you can't just advise somebody. So on what if you do? said to me, I really want to do that. That's what we're doing. I would put that in writing. You would sign it and say, we're trumping the department. They want to do Who, that. Who's the governing body? Um, the compliance department of our broker dealer. And uh, all that means is like the overall investment. Like I see portion of that. So it's private. Yeah. It's not like a government thing. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. no. So okay. like under that world, it, it's um, it gets dicey when you're like, I think you should put 100% of your money into X investment, Y investment, X right, policy. Because if it ever goes wrong, then somebody would yeah. try to sue you. And then it's like, he told me to do that. Yeah. I could see how if that If you could put go something in, I quickly. don't know, a product that you can't really touch the money for, I don't know, five years. And in three years, you want to buy a property with it. And I'm like, well, sorry, it's locked up. And you're like, I'm going to sue your F you or whatever. Right. There's a lot of bodies that are um, patrolling us in that world. Yeah. The good part is we have to disclose everything. For for the uh, consumer, yeah. for the clients, we have to disclose everything. We have to basically share with them everything. They have to sign everything, and we can't just make blanket recommendations. We have to have notes behind it, reasoning behind it. And this is as a financial advisor, correct? Specifically, yes. And now you're. If talking, I was a business coach, whole different ball game. Or if right. I was, uh, but you're kind of getting into that world a little bit, right? a little bit with real estate and the businesses and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, because it kind of goes hand in hand. Like I would say that a lot of small business owners have extra funds and they want to you know yeah. manage their wealth right so that's why i was asking i just it sounded so limiting to call you a financial advisor because people like even when don sure. was trying to introduce us and, and explain you yeah. he's like this guy's great and he's like <laughs> he's, he he tells you like he talks to you blah 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 like he, i'm like okay he's like what does he do yeah, he's so like so he's, I'm gonna like, help me or... he's like i don't know and he's like you guys should just go talk and i'm like all right cool yeah. <laughs> like it, it you know what i mean yeah. Th that name just but again i mean you're a great person and it's not like once you meet you and talk to you, it's very easy to figure out like what you can help with. Yeah. But that's why I was curious. It's, it's so interesting. Like I feel like a lot of my really great relationships that I build and clients and friends and so on and so forth are like centers of influence. People I'm referring back and forth all like almost introduced me in a very similar way. Yeah. Sometimes I coach them. Sometimes I don't. When I don't, I think it's funny that it's like, Hey, you just got to talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like you're in business. You talk to Dan. I'm like, Oh, okay. Like, well, that's sweet. why I started this podcast because yeah. I wanted to just sit and have uninterrupted conversations with people yeah. because I feel like that's all of life. You, you, it, life is so complicated and hard already. And if you don't have the time to just sit down and get into the details of stuff, you, you just can't. Yeah. It's too hard. Yeah. Yeah. He can help you. How? Yeah. Uh, I can't, I don't know. I like don't know. you got to sit and talk to him and yeah. like really get into the nitty gritty and, I feel like that is the case for so many topics of life. Yeah. I mean, government, religion. I mean, all the stuff that I talked about on all my podcasts. It's like, yeah. I hate those headline readers. I hate the knee-jerk reactions. I hate people who talk about things without really understanding the stuff. And to understand the stuff takes time, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, there's no way around it. You just have to sit and communicate and like, why does this do this? Why does this work like that? Like, how does this work? And that just takes time and talking. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, one thing I, I kind of just is kind of popping in my mind here is the more and more business owners I work with, whether it's in for financial planning or for just in general, yeah. is they're taking a lot of risk in their business. So when they come to me, it's all about mitigating risk. Yeah, yeah. It's actually kind of funny. It's like um, 
well, I don't really know if the podcast industry is going to keep going up. So <laughs> yeah. if all my money's in podcasts, yeah. well, well, what if in five years from now it's not as strong or maybe it goes away or whatever? So when people are nervous around, like, oh, what if the construction, industry, what if the housing market bubble, but yeah. all this stuff, there's all this risk. So when they come to me, they're like, okay, so how do I protect my family? How do I mitigate risks here? How do I put other money in other places that are almost guaranteed to grow? Because if I also take risk in the stock market, which people could be considered risky in the shorter term, yeah. um, they get even more nervous. So yeah. it's all sometimes about like, okay, what how do we mitigate risk what are the best ways to understand and control your money yeah. and like use leverage and use that and so on and so forth so it's actually really interesting how people um when they come to me i would have thought uh you're still young you're still a business owner you would have been super risky like yeah, use all your yeah. money to do other stuff yeah, right? yeah but at the end of the day it's actually funny even the even people in their 20s th young 30s 40s they're like I still have a long period of yes. time to go through, but I'm taking so much risk. Like, please show me a different way. Yeah. Well, I um, think it's about balance too. I've talked about that before. Like, I think like if I could speak about this, I'm a business owner. Having a business in general is risky. I think some of my, some parts of my life, I want to not be risky. You know what I mean? I want them to be safe and secure, easy. Sure. Cause yeah, this could go under tomorrow. And then there goes my source of income, even though it's doing well now, why yeah. not tomorrow? But yeah, no, I just, I find it very interesting what you're doing. Because what you're doing is a little bit of the life insurance, right? I could say that. Life yeah. Insurance. yeah I, a little bit of the advisement, a little bit of the real estate. It's just, you're hitting on so many different sectors. And you're also kind of friends with a lot of these people. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. it's got to be a, a little bit of a difficult world for you to live in. So, I'll put it this way. I, actually, most of my clients are almost can be categorized very very similarly yeah so the planning that i do it's really 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 in depth and really quality yeah. for a specific person yeah so if you're 35 you have some sort of inconsistent income like you're in high-end sales or you have some sort of business you probably have a spouse and some kids and maybe a couple of houses that's literally my clientele oh. so that being said there's similarities yeah so my team knows when i onboard somebody well, we're probably going to look at doing X, Y, and Z and somewhere in between this instead of this. Yeah. Like, I'm not like this. I have a 60-year-old I'm doing retirement planning for. I have a 22-year-old I'm trying to get insured. I've, oh, so you're really it, it's, specific. It's very specific, actually. Oh, I didn't know So that. my the cool part is my team's very knowledgeable, and I'm very knowledgeable in a specific area. But I do have a resource and do have other partners who work in other areas, too. Oh, so, okay. for example... Say, what do you do if you come across a client you're not... Not that you're not interested in or that you just don't feel capable of taking care of. Yeah. So one good example is um, I got introduced to a business that does um, like it was almost $30 million a year, had like wow. six or seven partners, um, a lot of in-depth planning, a lot of documents. So we had to read a lot of in-depth everything. Um, there was a partner where I work with um, at, the, at my firm who specializes in working with succession planning, yeah. exit planning certifications. Really, really great. It's been there, done that a million times. Sheesh. And we have a back end, we call it Business Resource Center, who will actually, there's there's attorneys on the group, there's CPAs on the group, who will read the documents for the company, get, give us ideas, get organized. And what we'll do based on the goals of the company is get a little bit more in depth. Wow. Um, so we'll come and say, okay, we got to carve these three partners out. We got to make sure if that everything happened to them, we got those solidified. If this happens with the business, okay, you guys want to sell it in 10 years, this is what it's worth. We have Jeez, really cool tools please. in that world. I will say just in the short period of time, um, it's been almost seven years that I've been involved. I'm not an expert in that world yet. Right. So but that being said, I have team. those resources. Yeah, yeah, so when I get those team. intros, the first thing I say is, okay, I got the team in place. Let's do it. Like I'll sit and learn. I won't be the one leading and talking as much because I'm not the expert in the room. Right. Um, but it's good that you know that about yourself and that you have a team. Now, is this all through one company? Yeah, it's through the, the company that you're working for. So our com are we have we have a um, we're backed by two massive one insurance company, one broker dealer, and that's really what gives us that well, I'm power. Sorry, broker what? Broker dealers like the investment wing of it okay. all. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's what gives us the power behind us for sure. And then that's got each of those has teams of people that yeah all the things. So you like just I said. just know uh, really what uh, what a great advisor does, whether it's advisor in general or finance, whatever, is know who to call. So, like, for example, if you're, like, asking all of these tax questions and I make a phone call and I get you the answer or you're trying to buy another property and you don't have the, the best 
I don't know, mortgage person, and I get you that answer. Yeah. Like I have the team already built in place, yeah, and, whether and you're it's providing value. Exactly. That's the value you bring. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's very similar to what I do. It's just funny to hear it from your perspective and what you're doing. Because that's sure. what I am as a general contractor. Yeah. People call exactly. me because they trust me like to find an electrician, to find a plumber, to find somebody that can help them get you know, financing to build the addition they want. You know, I have this problem at my house. What should I do next? Like, it's so funny how they're very similar. And I feel like that's almost all businesses. You find a person that becomes an expert in their field, and then they just not necessarily do everything that you need, but know how to find somebody yeah. that can get you what you need. It's, it's a guide. I did a, a workshop to actually a bunch of real estate people on Friday with my business attorney. Yeah. And I drew this thing. I'm going to try to explain it without drawing it. Um, and really how it was is... I drew <laughs> Ice cream truck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, time out. Time out. I'm, I'm not going to ice cream. I would love some freaking ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Literally the same. Um, I'm just going to... And like... So what I did is I drew a circle in the middle of this board and I said, that's you. And I said, you're Josh Allen. You're number 17. Yeah. You're the best Bills quarterback we've seen in a while since the Jim Kelly days. And you're sitting in what's happening in the, in business. You're a business owner. Is you're, what are you doing? You're taking all the hits. You're running the plays. You're doing all this stuff. And what me and my team act as is the QB coach yeah. or the overall coach. Like we're Sean McDermott on the same side. So we're not on the field, but we're running the plays with you, helping yeah. you out along the way. We're guiding you. So if we need to get an answer on taxes, well, our CPA might be Diggs, who we have on the sidelines who are throwing the ball every now and then. Yeah. Maybe we need our, our running back and play, and that's our insurance person or so on and so forth. And I drew out this big diagram. Yeah. And I find that business owners, um, in a lot of sense, not only don't know um, the right plays to run and don't have the right advisors, but almost more embarrassingly, aren't even knowing what sport they're playing. Right. They're like on the field and they're like supposed to be, they're playing football, but they're actually should be playing soccer. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's the challenge is they don't have that guidance. They're kind of diving in feet first. Yeah. Well, I would say because I am a business owner, like from my side of it, I'm too damn busy. Like you yeah. just said, like I have to do all that stuff. Sure. You know, I got to, I had to get this shop. I still have to go to the job site. You know, this is a construction person. Yeah. I have my daily tasks of things to do. I don't have the time to find the right CPA that yeah. I can trust. I don't have time to get into the taxes. Like I'm trying to be knowledgeable on so many things, Sure. but everything takes time. Yep. You know, not only am I not capable of doing it probably because I'm in construction, not taxes. I don't have the time to properly research a qualified tax guy yeah. or a qualified this or a qualified that. But this goes back to what I tell my guys a lot of times. And I'll, I'll talk is I think that's a good quality of the leader. And I think a quarterback is, is the leader of the team. Yeah. a lot. Your job is to know your limitations. Your job is to put the proper people in place to do what they need to do. Like as me as a business owner, that's why I talk to you and like, yeah. I, it's my responsibility for my family, for my business, for my money to talk to a guy like you, because I know I don't have the time, resources, or dedication sure. to take care of the money the right way. Like, let me do what I'm good at. But being a good leader is is knowing that you're not good enough to do everything. Yeah, you know, and having the proper team in place. A hundred percent. You know, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that no, was, you nailed it. Yeah, I just I I can very much agree with what you're saying. And if like it it dawns on you that oh wait, I need to maybe get my money a little bit tighter. I need to yeah. understand some some strategy. Maybe I need to figure out the, the tax world. Maybe I do need to figure out X, Y, and Z. And if you get strong enough and your team's strong enough to just make a phone call yeah. as quick as possible, yeah. you're like, you know what, Dan, I need life insurance as soon as possible. Let's get that process started. Well, that day, it's not on your mind anymore. You're doing it. Yeah, yeah. And so when people call me around all the different topics around money, uh, I could give them an answer. We can move things quickly. I can get them in front of the right person as quick as possible. Yeah. And that's how you run a successful business is know to call when. Yeah. Like you just said, you're running quarterback yeah. on the field. Yeah. It's like, wh what if you don't have anybody to throw the ball to right. and your line isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're, what's going to happen? Screwed. Yeah, so that's how I think a lot that's of businesses what, like, fail. Yeah. That's what not only understanding your advisors, and that's why I drew this out for them, but then it's also like when you're starting to build a team, how that looks and showing the because like not only have I learned from a lot of people that I've done it, I'm also doing it on a couple fronts. Yeah. So my perspective sometimes is helpful yeah. uh, around this. Well, but. I know that there's specific entities and people who are just business coaches. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's I what have they a teach. Do you have business coaches? Yeah. Like I personally? Have, yeah. Really? For your 
invest for your financial advisement business? Yeah, and um, and the other, we actually have a team coach who's our business coach for all the stuff we do with Ace and the really? team. Really, we I also have a personal business coach who helps me and my team grow. No shit. Yeah, the thing is, is like, you just. Know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would. Ju- I was just gonna say, just like, um, like, right now, I'm. I've learned a lot. But I'm just getting warmed up. Oh How am I supposed to get to the next level? Learn from other people. So I'm in a mastermind group with all people that are more experienced than me, that are all amazing, that are they're, they're learning some stuff from me. I'm learning a lot from them. I'm taking all their perspectives and learning. Yep. So I, I hired a coach to get to that next level. How am I supposed to make the next hire? How am I supposed to get to the next place? I, it's it's almost a catch twenty two in my mind because I, I think about this a lot. We're all moving up a ladder, whether it's a corporate ladder, whether it's a life ladder. Sure. As you get older, my biggest problem with it is like there's almost a stigma of like paying coaches because there's so many like fake coaches out there and sure. bad coaches and, and entities. People have such a hard time with, oh, I'm going to pay this person for my education. But really, you're paying that person not for your education, but you're paying for their experience because they had to pay for it to somebody else. Yep. And they had to put the time in. And you're constantly doing this leveling up. Like if you're serious about it, you're always paying somebody. And then I feel like in 10 years, I'll be paying a hundred grand to somebody for their education. Exactly. And then in 10 more years, I'll be paying a million dollars to somebody because you keep moving up this ladder, you know, cause right now I have, I have coaches. I pay them two fifty a meeting. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. Sure. We meet once a month. We talk about shit. Like sure. it's not anything serious, but I'm sure in 10 years I'll be paying different coaches or somebody that like 2,500 yeah. bucks, you know, for, but it's, it's because you learn X amount of stuff from that person. They give you their life experience and then they're going to move up. Because they're still doing their own stuff. But you still need to... It's almost a respect thing. Like, you just have to appreciate that you're not just giving somebody your money. You're, yeah. you're giving it to them for, for their experience so that you don't essentially have to go through it. But you then can level up. You yeah. know? It's just... I struggled with that for a long time. Because, you, you know what I mean? There are a lot yeah. of douchebaggy type people out there and, and schemers and, and people that will just take your money and not give you you know what you're looking for i guess yeah in a sense i mean in any profession we can we could talk about this all day long we could, let's talk about construction and financial services yeah yeah yeah. financial services you could pay me and my team move all of your money do all the other things and be like this person sucked they didn't do it what they said they were going to do yeah. they did a terrible job they didn't educate me they didn't do anything in construction we could probably paint oh. the whole world of pictures and in yeah. financial service the same yeah well um, I, I equate this to there's always good and bad people yeah i've said this in other podcasts so if I call no matter you, what you're doing no matter where you are cops everything there's just good yeah. people and bad people yeah so i think that's where a lot of the man we can we don't have to give construction examples because we, we get we get it this is the let's podcast co- about everything and call, anything brother let's go down the rabbit hole yeah i mean at the end of the day if i call a contractor and i need my bathroom remodeled and they're like okay it's 10k so how it's gonna work and all of a sudden, that you said the day you're going to be done is today, and you're not even started yet, and you didn't even bring the materials. Oh, it's going to be 20k. That's great. You're halfway through it now. Yep. You're six weeks behind. All that stuff. So I think no matter what, it all has to do with: Do you like? Do you trust that person? And like, what's their reputation? Yep. So like, if I get a like, if you say, "Hey, I got to meet the team," or you got to meet Dan. He's the best. I've worked with them. My people work with them. It's great. Yeah. Most of the time, you're probably going to get a pretty good experience from that person because you already have had people like have worked with you, gone through yeah, it, the whole thing. Trust and reputation. Exactly. Right? That's so, a, I, I'm, I focus on that in my business a lot. I mean, that's yeah. more than anything, more than the dollar amounts, more than the the product. I mean, if you don't have a good reputation, if you don't have, tr- if people don't trust you, you might as well close your business tomorrow. Yeah. Because it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You so, have to have that. In your business, do you ask for referrals? No. I mean, I should I, see. I'm in a I'm in a growth stage. I, I've never been in the position I've been been in before. Yeah. When I started the company, it was just me. It, it wasn't really Run a company. Around, yeah. yeah, it was just I started an LLC. I put a name on it, Leroy and sure. Sons Contracting, and it was but it was just me sure. going and fixing people's shit. But I built a good reputation by doing good work, and then in word of mouth referrals, we yep. kept on growing. And then this is the hard part, and I think this is probably where you you would understand this that a lot of business businesses struggle with this me doing work as a business a one-man business going to having an actual business with employees and taxes and insurances it is a totally different role for me i became a manager no longer you don't do you don't do carpentry anymore well i mean i do occasionally here and there and i'm still good at it but i if i want my business to be successful i can't 
I can't. I have to be a good manager. Yeah. Because if my, if my guys aren't putting out quality construction, if people don't trust them, if people don't respect them. Their name's on it. My name's on it. And then my reputation gets bad, and then the word of mouth stops, and then the money stops, which is yeah. ultimately what it all comes down to. But yeah, it's you. It's call, all called business, but it's two completely different things. Oh, yeah. You know, being a manager and being an operator. Not even the same thing, slightly. I actually have seen that more in the construction world than pretty much any under, any other industry because they're like, all right, I'm making some good money. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. I love doing this. Yep. I really want to build something. Yep. And then all of a sudden, workers' comp comes up, and you're like, oh, my God, I got to yep. pay for that. Yep. All of a sudden, an employee, you got you to gotta manage two employees now and yep. so on. Almost every great hire we've made um, or my team's made at Ace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ace Handyman Buffalo is the company I'm a partner in, and, yeah. and I haven't actually shared that too much on social, um, well, you but have I do. Now, I do. We got I do a post lot some of stuff. Followers. Yeah, I'm just kidding, I don't know how many we got. and my team's awesome. We're doing some amazing work, but it seems like all our best employees and all the best people have actually came from. They've already ran businesses, yeah. And by that, they wanted to be. They were a great worker. They loved it. They started a business and realized, holy crap, this is a huge pain in the butt. I don't want to do this anymore. 100%. So can someone give me structure again? Yes. Um, at the end of the day, there's definitely opportunity to join our group from a partnership standpoint yeah. as you're doing great work, as you're growing with us. So we yeah. are working on a structure on a couple of the people in our world because they're done such, they've done such a great job and they have that. I think they have like a business owner heart. Um, yeah, they want some but, equity. But it's, it's tough. Because hourly, hourly is just hourly. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's no, um, you want to build something, even if you're not the owner of the company, yep. I think, because I've been looking into this too, is sure. I think you got to give people, and this is, you can go back to finance, lending, this is why you put down 20%. The bank wants you to have some skin in the game. Yep. Just like a, a good employee probably wants to have some skin in the game. So if I help my company make a million dollars gross in a year, I want some of that. And I think that's like what profit sharing is with like, I know Geico does it. Do we so you know, a lot of um, this actually a lot of strategy I do in the finance world is actually around um, business owner structures like that. Oh really? Like how do you buy in? See, this is why I'm doing the podcast, bro, because I'm a business owner. I didn't even know it, you did that shit. Yeah. So like, there's <laughs> p the the basic one po profit sharing um, is a way to do that. That usually doesn't give you ownership. Yeah. Depending on the whole structure of it. Yeah. There's ways to get percentages, and you you do it as a distribution. There's yep. ways to um, carve out key people or like if you're like hey my business doesn't run without these two people those are the two people where you got to get we they call it like um you're not supposed to discriminate between your whole population but you can discriminate in certain ways for those key people that yeah, run your business discriminating. i don't even like that the word, word the word is know, where it gets it's how they talk about it it's not the i right know word. what you, i know what you i mean. agree i've been i've been trying to be Carve really out. careful about yeah i've been yeah. trying to be really careful about the words i use because yeah. just like i said your financial planner title almost i think hurts you yeah because it's not just what you do it's so specific i try to pick my words very carefully because yeah i said this on a previous podcast we're all speaking english but we don't all speak the same language correct what you think of this word means this is not what somebody else might think of and when you say a sentence they might take it a different way Communication is tough, especially this day and age. Yeah, it's yeah. so hard. So, but I do know what you mean. You you got to give that person those good employees incentive to do well. Yeah, you want to give them skin in the game so that they're going to go out and act like it's their company. And if you give them a little bit of percentage, a little bit of something, they're going to act like it's theirs, even yeah. though it's not entirely theirs. And then they're going to get their due respect, their due pay because of that. Yep. So I totally agree with that. That's, yeah. But it's a very difficult um, thing to figure out initially. Because you don't want to give away too much. You don't know how to structure it. You don't want to screw anybody over. Yeah. You don't want to screw yourself over. Again, some, which is why some of the biggest so companies in the, in the country, and honestly the world, um, have some of the wealthiest people as executives, and they're not owners. Really? So, like, people, they call it entrepreneurship. Um, and it actually has to do with, like, those, I don't know, the, the for maybe the first couple employees are grew to something or whatever. They don't have any ownership. But through their stock options. Oh. Let's just say that how that works? Let's just say you have, I don't know, a million stock options because over the years you've built it and now the company's worth a hundred dollars you have a hundred million dollars technically like literally in stock options plus all the hundreds of thousand dollars in pay and oh, so on and so forth so, so people sense. do it that way is and that why CEOs are worth so much money usually no shit. usually i was always curious because that's what i mean as i'm getting to be more of a business owner you start yeah. to understand more of it's such a complicated world the sure. corporate world but really the corporate world is just Business, small businesses that got really organized and figured out the procedural crap of growth. 
Yeah. It's all that, and then you just get to a level where you become corporate, you know, because yeah. it's all so structured. So if you, if you started out, let's say you started a company and you built it to a hundred million dollar company in, over the next 20 years, and you started with stock options that are 10 cents each, everybody can buy a, an option for 10 cents. All of a sudden, if you go public and that's worth a dollar, that's 10 X. What if it was worth $10? It's a hundred X. Now, do you, do you understand stocks pretty well? Can I ask you? Yeah, go for it. So like those people who bought stock options yeah. when it was 10 cents, that 10 cents, does that go to the actual owner to invest into the business? How does that work? So... Yeah, so basically you're generating capital. Oh, okay. So okay. what? What is? That's why I was always curious so, about like what, how do stocks actually work? And again, I'm kind of playing stupid a little bit because I want. I think this is what people need to understand about yeah. businesses and corporations and stocks, because it seems so. You hear about these day traders and stocks and all this, and I don't think people really understand the sure. point. You know, if, if somebody's buying a stock, you are buying a thing that's helping that company essentially grow. Correct. And then you're hoping that that company grows even more. And then your stock that you bought at X amount of dollars then grows because that company was able to grow with your capital infusion. Yep. And then your stock becomes worth way more. Correct. Okay. So very, very simply, if you buy $10 of Apple stock, you are buying this little baby portion of Apple. Yeah. It might be one, one millionth of a percent of whatever, yeah, but, but it's it, technically of Apple. You that, own Apple. Right. But that $10 goes right to Apple. Correct. And then they can use that ten dollars yep. for whatever they want. Yep. Okay. So that's when you when you see like they're I'm we're issuing more shares. Yeah. They're basically giving out more of the company to get more money uh, to do stuff with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two different. We're not going to get into the different types. No, That'll just start yet. to confuse people. But like there's different ones because sometimes people give um, money and they want money back. It's called a dividend. Yeah. In those types of stocks, let's just say you give ten dollars and they're going to give you a dollar back a quarter or whatever the math is. Yeah. Um, there's they, types of stocks like that. Right. Um, and but then there's other types of stocks that are they're, they're going to keep growing and hopefully they're going to push your price up. Right. So tens now twenty and thirty. Et but I mean that company still needs to generate more revenue and more income to be able to pay that dividend. Correct. It's not like they're just they can't yep. just come up with money. Yeah. So a good example is why people say buying single stocks are very risky is this. If you buy, I don't know, I mean, Apple, we, we know is a very strong company, but let's talk about it. If Apple went out of business for whatever reason, some big companies have um, in the past, Enron and Kodak yeah. and yeah. so on and so forth. Um, let's just say, I, 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 I think Apple's a very, very strong company besides the point though. In this example, you put a hundred, all you'd say you have a hundred thousand dollars to your name. That is it. You put it all on Apple stock and that goes to 200,000. Technically on paper, you doubled your money, right? You're up a hundred thousand dollars, and so you put a hundred in. It's up two hundred. You never touched it though, so no taxes were involved. It's all good. You made money. Let's just say Apple goes to zero. You lost all your money. Yeah. It goes to zero. You have zero. You have nothing. Yeah. yeah. So that's why people say single stocks are very risky because it's one company. Yeah. You've seen in the small small business space, dozens of your friends probably go out of business. Oh yeah. And you've seen that, but let's like scale it up. It's the same math, even if you're right. bigger. Well, that's what I was trying to even say. Even if you're bigger, you're still gonna, you could still go out of business right. or get bought out and it works differently, well, etc. I, I, I try to explain to people because I think corporate corporations have this this stigma. I use the word stigma a lot. I gotta do some. You guys gotta find me a different word. <laughs> read some books, bro. I do read books. Bro. <laughs> read more books. Come on. Um, there's that thing like corporations are bad, like yeah. bad corporations. I don't think corporations are inherently bad it's just like i said you figure out stuff as you get bigger yep. you know what i mean like it becomes easier to do what you're doing when you can off offer stocks like i can't go get money right now to keep my construction business going i have to go ask for like a loan yeah well they can they're just up the ladder and i think when you're that high like you said like they don't want to go out of business they have to make hard decisions that people yeah. might not like that are like oh they're evil I don't think they're evil. You have responsibilities. It's it's a small business that business big business that became a big business. You know they still have to do what they got to do to make money to then pay the dividends and do all yep. that crap. You know it's very it's very difficult and very complex. Yeah, it uh it is. I mean, at the end of the day, I think we could probably agree that like everybody thinks everything's bad and everything's good. Yeah, yeah. Like it doesn't matter what it's we're talking about. It's not that black about. and white. I actually talk about financial products like this all the time. I say every financial product that's ever been made is made for a specific reason. Yeah. It's really, really great for that reason. Yeah. If it's if it's put in a different reason, different place, different it's like a it's like a puzzle. Yeah. You've got a thousand pieces, we're putting this thing together. If you try to put a piece in the wrong place, doesn't it's work. not gonna really work. Right. Um 
sometimes we can form it and move it around and maybe it looks okay. The picture still works. Yeah. Um, but that's what a lot of people are, do is they're like, okay, I was told to put all my money here. Yeah. Well, that person's way younger than you're way older than you have different perspective, different goals, Life different situations. Kind of yeah, so it's, it's very tough to be like, so okay. Situational. So it, situational. And one of the biggest products I, I see why it was amazing for the people that, that did it really, really like at broad amounts and why it's not great anymore. It's retirement accounts. Yeah. And we don't have to get into any logistics around it, but like people are like, I'm going to put all my money into that place. And then they tell me that they're going to make more money moving forward and taxes are going to go up. That's what they tell me. Yeah, yeah. So I said, you're going to not pay taxes now. And then what you just said was taxes are going to go up and you're going to make more money. So you're going to pay way more tax in the future. I just saw I people just literally saw, um, say that to me. And I'm like, so why are you putting all your money there? And they're like, that's a good thought. I go, you yeah, just told me it. I, I didn't even tell you anything. I just saw a social reel that said that. Like, you get to put your money away into your 401k tax-free, right? But I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. Because when you take that money out, and I'm telling you, yeah. I can tell you some personal experience. My mom, like, a lot of people don't understand that. Like, well, I thought that money was mine. I'm like, no, no, no. That's going to become income. You're just not paying taxes on it now. Yeah. You still have to pay taxes on it. It's not as much money as you think. It's very difficult. You're much better off investing your own money and managing it yourself and staying on top of it. Then you can make real money. You know, it's that's why I got into real estate. No I just saw something today that resonates with that. And they said if you're a W so you're partners with the government. That's what the, that's yeah. what this was. And we're not gonna get into too much depth of this, but I'm gonna give you the baseline of what it was. And it says the gov when you're a W two, the government is the active partner. They dictate a lot more. Yeah. When you're not, and you're an owner, a business owner, you're now equal with the, them, and then you be, can become. If you start owning real estate, if you're in business, you can become the active partner. Yeah. Admit it, you can have deductions. You can get creative, etc., like, etc., yeah, etc. Et like so the, when you're a W two and and the government's that active partner, if you say I have a million dollars in an account like that, you never paid a dollar of tax. You owe tax on that. And let's just say one day they say blanket. If you touch a dollar in your 401k, it's 50%. So I don't know if they see that happening, I but it could. I could see if we, that if we happening look at, for sure. If we look at the tax um, history over the last 50 years, 100 years, whatever, since they started the tax code, um, we are in a very low environment. That being said, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't we know if it's going to get a low environment tax-wise. Tax -wise? Yeah. Bro, so if it goes listen, up, if it stays the same, you're it goes down. You're taking me down a rabbit hole. You don't want to go down because I'll start talking about government and the Tea we're not, Party. And we don't have crap. to get into that. <laughs> yeah. but very, but very I have simply, a lot of opinions about that. A lot of people are like, okay, I got a million bucks. But then if they blanket 50%, it's not a million, yeah, it's not a million it bucks. might be half that. Yeah. And your active partner could actually um, dictate a lot in that world. So that's what people just have to, th I think they just have to know about it. Yeah. I, I don't think anything about a 401k Roth pre-tax, what advantage is, I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. No. I actually, I put some of my money in that. Yeah. And I have a lot of clients, actually most of my clients do somewhat of it. I it's see just it the vehicle. amounts and yeah. what you put in. Exactly. It's just a vehicle. You just, you have to understand it entirely. And I don't think a lot of people understand finances in general. I think you they a lot of people hear things yeah and like oh I should have that and I'm like okay but do you really understand what it is why you're doing it what's your plan for it in the future like you can't just put money into it and just at the end of my you know career it's gonna be okay it's, it doesn't work like that you yeah. gotta use it almost as a vehicle to do other things or or this that and the other I got a three part question oh <laughs> oh you got a question That's I got yeah, he's, I got yeah he's he's involved <laughs> yeah what's your name my Sean. name's Sean Sean hey, man. Sean, I know it's a little hot here, so sorry. It's I, know, sorry. I, I am yeah. sweating a lot too. So I got red. I'm sure we're yeah. sure we're having fun. It's so, all right. <laughs> question number one. Yep. What's in your cup? Anything good? Yeah, it's something really good. It's actually like extremely cold water. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's huge, especially when the atmosphere is on fire right now. Yeah, it is. It's literally burning. Uh, down. It's literally burning. I drink um, water like an animal. Um, like I actually track this for a couple months, and I'm at 1.7 gallons of water a day. Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Over a gallon. Yeah, a almost two. I just like, so I'm the type of person, realistically, is always got to be like eating or drinking or doing something. So like, for example, if you just put a glass of water in my hand, that's enough. If I'm at an event you need, and you, you just keep you giving a me a water bottle. You need a thing. Yeah, I got to, I got to, I'll drink it. Yeah. What about so like if you're like, here's, gum or something so like that. that's, um, that sometimes works. Yeah. But like, for example, if you're like, Here's a beer, and you keep giving me a beer. I'll probably drink it. Just keep or, drinking beer. <laughs> or like the party animals. I know that problem. Say, you keep giving him beers in his hand. He'll get I, I like to, I like to eat. So if we're eating cake, we're eating cake. Like if you like, yeah, hey, yeah. here's a great salad. I'm like perfect. Um, 
So at the end of the day, like, yes, I can control myself, but like, if I'm like, I'm thirsty, I'm warm, and water just makes the most sense I, right now. I'm not trying to knock addiction, healthy addiction. That's I, all it yeah. is. I love water. I is. drink only water, and if it's not water, then it's something with alcohol in it. <laughs> oh, mine's, <laughs> mine's iced tea. I, my, my advice is iced tea. Yeah. I make it by the gallon. I mix it myself. It's like, I, like when I go home. Tea? Yeah, uh, Lipton's oh, Lipton's yeah. lemon iced tea. You know, I just got Lipton's half and half, and it's like. It's literally in the thing you mix yeah, yourself, yeah, yeah. but it's lemonade iced tea. Oh, dude. It's really I, freaking every good. Every day when I go home, like, we got these big glass mason jars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just... It's, With vodka I, in it. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta have that. Like, ice cold iced tea. Just yeah. sit there, just like you with the water. It's like, sit there and sip it. Yeah, I'm I wish sorry, I had something more fun. You, you have more parts to your Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, that was only one. There's two more. <laughs> that, there's two more. So, Can you take notes for me, please? <laughs> yeah, right? So I think a, a good thing that you brought up, because you brought up 401k, I think a lot of people get into 401ks mm-hmm. and they don't completely understand it. And you were talking about, well, in the future, your taxes are going to be higher because you're probably going to make more money. So No, no, no. Not that you're going to make more money. Taxes Taxes will, will go up. And you might get to a higher tax bracket, sure. too. So well, do you have that, any is input? Is that the case, though? I'm just saying uh, overall taxes. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll explain this. I keep going. So I just think it would be cool if you, as a financial advisor, could just give a brief description between Roth and pre-tax. Because yeah, think, like that was huge when it finally dawned on me what the difference was. So if you had any input on that, I think that would be cool to know. Sure. So to clarify the first part of the whole tax thing, right now none of us have a crystal ball. Taxes are here. Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they staying the same? Um, they do have some things in writing that it looks like they could go up. I'm not sure. That's not that's not for sure right now. Um, that all being said, uh, if you made more money and you did get to a different tax bracket, you would be paying more in taxes. Right. Correct. I, I think I don't. I don't think that's what you were asking. I think it's that's both. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, taxes. You know, might go up. Yeah, they might and say the same you might make more money as you grow up and go into another tax bracket. Yes. So if if we had an example, but not here, on your raw, not on your. So, so that's what we're going to do. Retirement next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so what what he's talking about? So if you put a dollar in and you didn't pay tax on it, when you take it out, you owe taxes. So right. if if the tax bracket's at ten percent today and you didn't pay taxes and you go to retire and it's at ten percent, it's the same math. But that's what I'm saying. You're not. That's my point. Is you're not. Because you have a million dollars in that retirement account, you're not at a different tax bracket because you have that much more money. You, I'm talking about overall life taxes are yes. going to go up. You're going to have to pay taxes on that money when you pull it out. You could pull out ten grand and you're paying taxes on ten grand. Correct. You could slowly pull out that money so you stay into a lower tax bracket. Yes. So that's so a I mean, strategy. But if right. you pulled all a million bucks, you, right. it looks like you're earning income that Co- year's a million correct. bucks. Correct. And that, I just wanted to clarify. That. Yeah. That's what it sounded like you were asking. Sure. I don't think that you're going to be classified as making more money because you have a million bucks it all depends on how much he, you take out at he, i think what he's saying is um i'm 29 <laughs> when i'm 35 hopefully i'm making more money and that might bring me to a different tax bracket is that fair that's exactly what i was saying because okay. you're getting there when yeah but why you put the you money pay? in at 10 percent, and then if you retire at that 10 percent tax bracket then you're not losing any money but yeah, if you put the money point. in pre-tax at 10 percent when you're in that bracket but then you're making you know two million dollars a year and that money's been in there. Now you're getting taxed at thirty yeah. percent. You should have pre-taxed it while you're at a lower tax bracket. Is what I'm saying. Should've and that's where pre-taxed it a lower. That's tax where bracket. Roth and pre-tax. Where I think the benefit is Roth. Yeah. I have like so most of mine doing Roth. Right I now. think I get your say. I think there's some confusion on no, just yeah. the exact concept. But yeah. So so the difference really is is right now tra- traditional four hundred one k's. You're putting in money pre-tax. What you're doing is you're not paying tax and you're actually taking a deduction. So it's actually looks like you've made less money because you're putting that money into an asset. Yeah. So it's called pre-tax money. That is going to grow pre-tax. And what we call it is postponing taxes, or it's called tax deferred vehicles, but tax to per- postpone is what I understand it as. When you go to touch that money, you still owe the taxes. So if you're like, you know what, I think taxes are fine, we're good, I want to take the deduction this year, I'd rather pay less this year, so that's what people you, are doing. When you take that money out, you'll pay taxes at the rate whatever when you rate put you're it in? At. No, whatever rate you're at when you take it out. Yeah, but that's, what if you retire, your your income is what you pull the money out as. Yes, exactly. So if you're if I'm 29 and I put... Um, <laughs> Don't hit the table. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's just, it, you can hear it in the mics. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's <laughs> such a producer thing to do. Don't hit the table. Um, that's okay. where I'm getting confused. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Is So you when you put money in, you're getting the deduction today. 
it, there's no taxes going on in a pre-tax world traditional 401k. When I'm 60, because you have to be 59 and a half to not get that penalty. Yep. But let's say I'm 60 and I take out my, uh, I don't know, $100. I put in 100 didn't pay tax on it, and I put it on. I put it in at, let's say I would have paid, if I paid the tax up front, which we're going to talk about in a second, and let's say that would have been 10%. That doesn't matter if you didn't pay the taxes. That doesn't matter. It's a moot point now. Yeah. When I take that out at age 60, uh, let's say it was 10%. It doesn't matter. I'm paying 10% either way. But let's say you're right. I'm making more money. I'm pulling more money out. Now I have money coming in. Yeah. And taxes went up to 30. Instead of paying $10 in taxes on my 100, I'm now paying $30. Right. Yeah. It's, so that it's, being said, it's yeah, it's when you pull it out. Right, right. That that's what sense? I'm saying. But that 10% and that 30%, what tax is that? Like, what is... I'm that, just making up numbers. No, no, I know. But I'm, I, I know that. I'm saying uh, what... Uh, what sets that rate? What sets that rate? Is it like a, an overall federal the tax? Government. Yeah. Right, right. So that doesn't, but that's different than your income tax bracket because of how much you earn. It, so when you pull money from a retirement account, it comes out as ordinary income, just like your paycheck. Right. Yeah. So it would so, count as your income correct. tax bracket. Right. But that's what I'm saying. As you pull out the money, you control how much money you pull, you pull out. So you're, out. You're controlling yes. how much money is your income. If yes. I pulled out five hundred thousand dollars a year out of my eight million dollar retirement account, yeah, I'm in a five hundred thousand dollar tax bracket. But if I slowly pull out ten grand, sorry, if I slowly pull out ten grand, yep. I'm not paying the same tax bracket rate as a five hundred thousand dollar year earner. Correct. Okay. I see. You what see you're what I'm saying? saying? Yeah, I see if what you're you saying. set your income rate when you retire. It does. You're, you're. Everybody talks about the taxes as like it's like a set number, and once you get to this high level of income, that's your tax bracket. I don't think that's the case. I think it's how much money you're. You control your destiny. Yeah. You know. So if you can put in the money pre-tax, I think the goal of that is that you can put more money into it because you're not paying taxes on it, and then that money can grow more rapidly. Because instead of me being able to put in eighty dollars after paying twenty on taxes, I can put in a hundred. So that hundred might grow faster than the eighty, sure. right? Because now it's a hundred. Now every week right. it's two hundred instead of one sixty. Then it's three hundred instead of uh, three times yeah, two forty. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Sure. That's what I was. That's the point I was trying to see. Make. That no, I'm glad that we talked about it. And that's yeah. why I had that question. Yeah. Because right yeah. now I think my four hundred one k is about half Roth, half pre tax. But that makes and no I sense. I still it, don't understand the difference between what does that mean, Roth, Roth. and pre tax? Yeah. So Roth um, means you're paying taxes up front. And it's going to grow tax free. So when you take oh, that, that seems money like a out, way better idea. So what you're explaining is one side of like what you just explained is why don't I put as much money pre tax, save the taxes today, get to the point, take out less money, we're going to be good. The other side is why don't I put in all money so I'm never going to pay tax on it again. More right. like here and here. Yeah, when I plan, we're usually somewhere in between. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, but I will say... I think it depends on your strategy, what your It depends on you as a person. If I had to like generalize in any way, shape, or form, younger, not making much money, your money's going up probably more towards Roth, if I had to guess. Um, if you're like 50 years old and you make a lot of money, it might make more sense to just keep getting the deduction because you're probably going to pay at that higher tax bracket. Right, you don't, have, you don't have that much longer until you're going to start pulling it out. So taxes yeah. overall probably aren't going to increase change that much. much. But yeah, it makes sense to do Roth because we're, we have 30-some years before we retire. I can guarantee you, I know government, <laughs> our taxes are going to be higher in 30 years. So yeah, if you can pay taxes now at whatever tax rate it is, I would, be a, I would put a bet that it's going to be higher when you go to take that money out when you retire. Correct. For us. I think that's where it comes into play. Again, I'm just this is just my opinion. I, yeah. I think that's like what people don't understand is you have to have a plan and a strategy to really understand what you should be doing. Not just the initial benefit of the difference between a, a Roth and pre-tax. I think if I just taught every single one of my clients the different options they have just and I don't even I'm not even a huge pusher of retirement accounts because I'm 29 yeah. and I'm at 60. I have a lot of shit to do in the meantime. Right, right. I have a lot of businesses to run and do some things and make money and whatever. Yeah. If I just taught them the difference between Roth and traditional or pre-tax yeah. um, and then gave them one more bucket, one more option, most people would be like, wow, that was really great. Yeah. I'd probably make a video on it, call it a day. Yeah. And because the challenge is, is there's only three buckets to put your money in from a tax standpoint. Tax deferred, which is a 401k or an IRA or a 403b, other people. All the differences 
of those three, very simply, 401k is a corporation. 403b is literally a school or a hospital, basically, municipality, et cetera. And the third one's an IRA, which is individual retirement accounts, yours. So that's literally the tax deferred. That's one bucket. Roth 401k, Roth IRA. There's other things in that bucket. There are different types of life insurance. There's other areas like muni bonds, et cetera, are all tax free. Mm. And there's one bucket in between. It's called taxable. It's like when you get paid, you pay tax on your money. What do you do? You buy a stock, you have an investment portfolio, whatever. Sometimes, depending on how you work with real estate, it depends which bucket it goes in. Yeah. Sometimes it generates. Well, that's what I meant by it's so um, situational business, and it's so based yeah. off your plan. Like, what are you going to do? If you're just going to be a W 2 earner, you have a yeah. different plan than a person that, as a business owner, that oh, invests yeah. his money. Like, you, I, I think for people to say, like, a Roth IRA, I'm not saying this about you, just like, a Roth is the best one. Like, there is no such thing as a best one. Yeah. It's totally dependent about the person. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do in your life with your money? Yeah, the exact thing I started this whole thing was was every financial vehicle is built for a specific reason. Yeah. The 401k was actually built on here's a here's a history lesson real quick. In nine in the in the late 70s, early 80s, um, what every 85-ish, 85 plus percent of people had. Wanna take a guess what they had in the 80s, everybody? Uh a pension. Pension. Nailed it. Yeah. Great guess. <laughs> so people had a pension. If you had to describe a pension, how would you do that? Unlimited money for as long as you live. <laughs> yeah. So like, good example. That person made $100,000 and the pension says, we're going to pay you half of that for the rest of your life. Yep. And so these big corporations- are they don't exist anymore because it's not possible. Well, you can't. We well, live too long. But anyways. So yeah. somebody says, all right, I got 50 grand for the rest of my life. Okay. That's probably going to get me most of the way of retirement, right? Mm -hmm. Now what do we have on top of that? If I drew this out as a cake, we have the big base, the pension. It's like 50% of your income, let's call it. Yeah. Then on top of that, we have Social Security. Yeah. 20 to 30% of people's income was coming from Social Security. So now all of a sudden, let's call it, we're at 75% of our 100,000, we're at 75K. So the 401K came out, this is literally why. Because tax brackets were in the 70%. We're at 37 and a half or whatever, we're at 39. Uh, in the 80s? No, we were literally in the 80s and um, 70s. And that's not even, if you go back a little bit, it was actually at the 90 percentile at some point. At the top of the top of the top. Ooh. This isn't like your normal person. This is like some serious money type of yeah, stuff. But yeah. anyways, besides the point, they said, well, we got to be able to like get, like we got, people got to like defer some money or figure out a way to get out of this tax code. Yeah. So what happens is, is they would put enough money to make it whole. So you only need, 10, 15, 20% of your income built up in your 401k. Oh, so what people were doing is they were deferring or postponing at 70. When are they taking the money? Now at 30. It's the biggest tax move anyone's ever made. Yeah. My parents, Our parents' generation killed it. It's yeah. the best tax move you ever could have made. You're saving 10, 15, 20, 5, at least some percentages on taxes by paying it now instead of before. Oh, and see. before, you had almost 100% of your money being guaranteed by all this other stuff. So yeah. you need to put this much in your 401k. Nice. Guess what we got to do? The do whole we, thing. You guys have pensions? Uh, I do, yeah. You do? Okay. I'm very lucky. I do not. So I don't, I, I do in some capacity. Do you have one? Capability. Have a program okay. That opens up periodically. Yeah, it's minuscule comparatively, yeah. usually. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so possible. I will say under, instead of 85-ish percent, there's under 15% of the population. It's probably under 10 now. Oh, it's, um, yeah, it's have pensions. Rare. A lot of people, I have no comments on Social Security. But will we have the full amount that they did um, years ago and, and now? They're already saying they're cutting it at least 25%. Who knows? Yeah. But I, that being said, we have to now, instead of having 80% or 75% of the um, cake built, we're just putting the cherries on top, maybe a little whipped cream, a little hot sauce, or chocolate sauce. Yeah. Hot sauce. Like, damn, that's a rare <laughs> like sauce chocolate cake. sauce. Let's yeah, go. I'll try it. As long as a little it's little sriracha. Franks. Yeah, yeah, I'll try it. <laughs> yeah, for, it's sriracha. That's where I would go. Um, we have to build the whole thing. Yeah. So that's makes why a lot saving sense. money is not like, hey, save. People say 10%. If you save 10% of your money, you're not going to be close. Can't retire. Not going to be close. Be able to retire. People say 15. I'm like, okay, you're getting there. I used to say 15 to 20. I say 20 plus percent now. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, you have to rebuild all that stuff. Yeah. It's, it's not that easy unless you're a really good business owner, smart at real estate, or really understand how money works to get yourself to building fifty dollars to $100,000 in guaranteed income. It's right. pretty tough. Right. Um, I totally agree. I, I mean, that's, this, that's why I have all the rental properties that we've talked about. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, 100%. You, you cannot just rely on one source anymore. You can't. A lot of the advice we were getting was from people that had pensions. They don't, I don't think they even understand what the, 
what we're facing, uh, you know, in our age yeah. bracket. They, they just don't get it. So if know? I raised my hand in a group of 100 people and asked for advice, I would get advice from all those people that already did all that stuff. It yeah. worked for them. 401k right. was great. Yeah. Pension. Oh, yeah. What do you even need to work for? I got pension forever. Yeah, well, I know people and that they're had giving to me advice. And I'm like, hey, guys, um, can we call a timeout here? Everybody in my generation learned from you guys. Yeah. And it is literally the opposite day. Yep. So, because if everybody put all their money in pre-tax and they built up this thing, and let's just say we have a gr- ter- not a great day for the people taking their money out at 50% tax bracket, half their money is going away. It's yeah. disappearing. Yeah. So when I'm doing a retirement plan for somebody and I'm like, okay, you got 5 million bucks. Actually, technically, if we do this, not very strategically, you probably have like maybe 2.8 right. to start now. And all of a sudden, it gets a little dicey. And you got to make that last for the. You got to make it last forever. Forty years, if yeah. you live to ninety, you know, so, retire in your. 50. So before it was why they worked is because people people retired at sixty five, they were dying at seventy two. The math was easy, made sense. The companies had all this money, Social Security, all this money. Now, um, I just lost a grandparent. He was just about to turn ninety seven. I still have three other grandparents all in the nineties now. Wow. They all just turned, I think, ninety, ninety, ninety one, or something like that. Wow. And like, okay, 65, so that's 25 years. How many more years are they going to go Dude, that they're getting pensions? and they're 30-something getting... years. That's crazy. So the math worked for seven. Maybe it worked for 12. Does it work for 50? No. Not even close. That's why they don't offer pensions. Not anymore. even close. That's why pensions don't exist, yeah. except to the government. And that's soon and slowly getting phased out, you know, because yeah. I, I came from a government job, so I know that's why I have a pension. Yeah. I worked for New York State. Well, yeah. I had a New York State pension through the government jobs I had, but it, it, that's why they're so sought after now, those government yeah. jobs, because they're the last place you can get a pension. And, and if you if you look at the difference between, like, a Tier 1, um, like, teacher from 30 years ago to, like, the Tier 7 they're at now, yeah. it's, like, 60% guaranteed for the rest of your life to, like, here's 6%. Like, it's yeah, literally, it's like, here's 23% maybe. We'll see, depending on... And that's after you work for 30 years. Yep. Um, yeah, every it vests over a million years. Every tier like got that. worse than the last. Oh, way worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got very, very lucky and was able to get it at tier four. See, there you go. And that was like unheard of. And then five was worse. And then six was awful. And now I'm sure seven is, I mean, non existent. I mean, yeah. Sure I mean, at the end of the day, the actual pension. It's, still, it's still helpful. Yeah, well, um, anything helps. I think it's, again, it's yeah. a strategy. Like, like you said, it's you're building up, you got to have 100% of your income somehow. And you just got to find vehicles to build in parts of it. You know, yeah. you, when you retire, you can't just bank on Social Security because that's now, like, we'll be lucky if it's 10% of the income we need to survive. You, yeah. You have to have lots of different um, investment vehicles. I, I still guess. have one more. You can my, hit it. Why don't yeah, why don't you, you, can add it, you can end it with your last question. Okay, so my last one was way in the beginning of the podcast. You said, um, what was it? If, if the podcast genre isn't going to make it or if construction is not going to make it, where are you going to put your money that it's it's a guaranteed growth? Is there any guaranteed growth? And in this day and age, what do you think that would be right now? Guaranteed growth. Yeah, so... Um, Dude, you're asking a life insurance agent, like, like what should you invest in? He's going to go, life insurance. That was, that was going to be one of four <laughs> things I was going to mention. Um, that's, yeah. a different, that's a different that's arena. That's a whole other That's a different arena. Um, so, like, today right now, people think interest rates are high. In our, in our lifetime, I guess so. Yeah. If you look at interest rates overall, they're pretty damn low, but that's okay. Either way, when interest rates are not, when interest rates go up and up and up, what ends up happening is fixed income, bonds, um, money markets. You're seeing like ads for X banks getting you 4% or Crazy. whatever. So there is time where that will be probably above 25 3% guaranteed money market. You let it put it in a bank or put it in a fund. So I have a lot of people in money markets that are getting two to four to five percent guaranteed right now, literally just interest. Um, so that's great. Different bonds and different vehicles like that are fixed that we can literally lock in. A, I can lock in. I don't know a minimum up sometimes depending on it, thousand dollars upwards of whatever depending on the exact vehicle where you could put a good chunk of money and get yourself four or five six percent in different bonds, which is really cool. Um, so laddering those, getting strategies around those help. Um, there's types of life insurance, which we're not going to get into today that definitely would be able to do that just depending on a lot of variables and honestly what the purpose of it would be for if there's other protection. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, people think life insurance sometimes is amazing. Sometimes it's terrible depending on how you use it. 
if you can use it the right way, it's pretty cool. I was going to interject my opinion to end is I think it just, you have to do your research. I think yeah, if you, you have to look, understand it. I think the most beneficial pe- thing people could do is look back a hundred years and see what has been a hundred years is a long window. And I think if you look back and I mean, I, I just, from what I know about life insurance, if you look back at life insurance for a hundred years, that shows you it's it's very secure. You know what I mean? It has a great growth. Yeah. The stock market, you can a hundred years, it's got a a positive growth. Like I think that's my opinion is you just have to look back at history to see what is gonna be stable going forward. Yeah, I was really hoping when I asked that what you said, your answer was gonna be what I invested in. And it wasn't. <laughs> so <laughs> um, and then uh, crypto is like <laughs> crashing down. Yeah. Not that much of crypto, but yeah, so, so, like I got a lot so of what I fu- So stocks. one of my biggest pieces of advice to people in like business or depending on what they're in, but mostly like business is like like what people are really, really good at, they tend to like I don't know why people do this. They're like killing it in something and they want to go do something else. Yeah. And like, I, I don't understand. So like you're yeah. destroying it in I'm an idiot, X, right. Y, and Z <laughs> this, and you're making all this money. You're doing great. And you're like going to go like basically call a timeout on the play of all your money and all your growth to go like maybe start something else. And that's what's, what's challenging. So I'm like, okay, if you're, I'm not a huge, um, like put every single egg in one basket. I think you should put a lot of them in a basket you understand and you're great yes, at yes. your business, your real estate portfolio, you're this, you're that, you're whatever. I do think that's true. Yeah. I don't think you should put it all there. Yeah. So if you understand something and it works for you, then just do a lot of it. If you had to put a percentage on that, what would you, what would be the numbers? What do you mean? Like you just said, like put a lot of your eggs in the basket of what you're really good at. And obviously you should diversify a little bit. How would you break that up? We'll and we'll end it with that. I'll end it with what I put my money in. How about that? Yeah. Um, Fifty percent of my money is in business. Okay, and the and that's what you and business like you are good at and what you focus on. Yes. Yeah. Um, twenty five, which technically would still be considered in business, is in the stock market, and twenty five is in life insurance. Oh, okay. Um, and by stock market, that could be money market, that could be different bonds, that could be things like that. And in the investment world, but I just wanted um, to show people like that's a good breakdown of diversifying. I think. Yeah. I think what you're saying about people do really good and then they go crazy. Because I think you hear a lot of, you got to diversify, you got to diversify, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Well, that just means like maybe, you know, 50%, 25, 25. Like I would have, yeah. I was even going to say like 60, 20, and 20. Yeah, you it's know? probably like, close. You know um, what I mean? It's just that's, yeah. I, I think it helps to put percentages on it so you can kind of see it and if, on, on what you should actually be di- if I drew, If I drew this out, the money that goes into, uh, life insurance is fully getting pulled out to use for everything else. Yeah. Money and in, in investments, you can actually um, collateralize those sometimes yeah. and pull money out for other opportunities. So my mind's always on a swivel and it's always accessible. Yeah. So life insurance is just liquid yep. um, in the ways that I use it. Um, the investments are just timing. Yep. You can you could touch them anytime, but it's just, is it a bad day for it? Right. Did it go down? Right. Um, where you're, like you're the business the is volatile and the business is growing over time, Sometimes you can't like tomorrow pull a bunch of money out. Right. So having a good chunk of access to money or liquidity is huge. So like if you know that like you're like, all right, I want to get to have a hundred thousand dollars sitting in cash somewhere, maybe cash isn't maybe the best idea, but like money you could touch. Yeah. So there's other places to put it, but even if it's in cash, at least you can use that for an opportunity. I totally agree. Great yeah, we know Six forty-five. Let's do it. Thank you so much. That was super fun. We didn't even get to another topic. We didn't even get to anything else. Yeah. Are we still recording? Bye, everybody. Goodbye.